Well, I invite you to open your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes this morning. We'll be reading uh, verse 12 to the end of the chapter in Ecclesiastes 1. Isn't it interesting how a preacher invites a congregation to open their Bibles? It's a good idea, a suggestion. Um, we hold to sola scriptura. And so uh, if we believe the power of the preached word and what is happening here, uh, then we're going to open our Bibles so we can actually see what the preacher is talking about and ask questions and be like that church in Berea in Acts uh, as we examine God's Word together. So maybe I need to rethink that invitation language, I don't know. But uh, page 553 in your black hardcover there if you need that. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 12, I the preacher have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun. And behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is but a striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. There may be so many things in this life that we cannot hold on to. But this is the holy and enduring word of the God of eternity. Let's pray together. Lord God, we do ask your help in these moments. As we have just read these words, we've seen the language, we've heard them read, but we need your Spirit to illumine your Word to our hearts. That we might know how to apply this Word, how to live it out. Lord, show us what it's telling us about you and about ourselves, how we can know you more in these moments. Lord, give your servant strength that our meditations, words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, our attentiveness would be honoring to you in these moments. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe you keep a lockbox or a safe uh, in your house somewhere and you've got a key or a code tucked away so that you can open that box. I was looking for such a key this last week, uh, looking for a little longer than I expected to be looking. Uh, and that you know, there's important documents and other things in these, in these boxes. And I did find the box, or did find the, the key to the box. But I, I couldn't help asking myself, well, what if I can't find this key? What do you do then? You know, how do you get after these, um, these important documents and so on? And I thought, well, I, I probably would need to go to the manufacturer um, or to the one who made the box and made the lock in order to... Uh, get at these these important uh, pieces of information. And the teacher of Ecclesiastes has told us that all things under the sun, all things in this life is vanity. It's temporal, vapor, any attempts to take hold of it is just going to end in uh, frustration. We will not be remembered. Uh, what we do will not be remembered for long at all. So what's the point? What advantage is there in this life. Okay, we want the key that gives this life some meaning and purpose. Okay, we want to answer the question like we looked at last week in verse 3. What makes sense of the stuff of life that no one's going to remember anyway? Um, I know you're asking that question. You have been asked that question. because I'm asking that question. Why am I doing this? Is anyone going to care? Does my, my work and all those you know, everyday ups and downs of life that you've experienced in these last few days and you're going to experience in the days ahead, does that have any enduring impact? And what we'll find on this journey that the preacher king is taking us on is that life has really lost the key to itself. Um, it cannot give us the satisfying answer, the, the profit that we seek. There's no key under the sun. The next chapter, 
The teacher shows us all the different keys that he tries in this lifetime. None of them have worked to unlock the mystery of meaning and advantage to our lives. So where do we go for the key to this life? Well, we go to the manufacturer, to the locksmith. We go to the one who made this world, the one who has made us and placed us here, and we ask the Creator God for the key. So we do that. And guess what happens? He doesn't give it to us. He doesn't. I think we may find that to be one of the more important messages of Ecclesiastes as we go along here. He doesn't give us the key. We cannot get the key to this life. And since that's true, we have to trust the locksmith. We must trust him to to open the door to show us the gain, the answers that we long for. So the teacher says, you know, keep coming with me. We're, we're headed on this journey. We're going somewhere that you can't, can't quite see um, where we're headed yet. And he offers a little narrative on what he has committed his heart and mind to, then some poetry, a little more narrative, and a poetic conclusion here. His whole investigation, his search for the key is coming up empty. And both the, the object of this investigation, everything under the sun, and the mode of investigation itself, all the wisdom is frustrated. So the preacher tells us he's been king over Israel in Jerusalem. And that, there seems to be a clear break here. Some have said, and I may have mentioned this last week, but that, that the book of Ecclesiastes is more like a lab report where you're, you're getting little, little bits of information, little, little data points from the test that you have to sort of put all together, then, then neatly you know, divided uh, writing. But we do have these, these breaks, or what seem to be shifts, uh, that signal that, that the preacher is changing gears. When he says, I saw, or I considered, or I applied my heart, like we see in verse 13. Um, and we're not sure why Solomon would you know, leave his name out uh, of this, if, if this is coming from him first person. Um, but Solomon's experience, his the opportunities that were afforded to him fit so very well uh, in what's being conveyed here by this preacher. Um, and so th- this type of identity marker, it, it, it tells us to, to pay attention that, that this preacher king is worth listening to. He's been king in Jerusalem, so he's going to have access to things that the average person wouldn't have access to, records, experiences, opportunities, um, worth listening to. And even acknowledging the task, acknowledging that he has to seek, he has to search out by wisdom, it shows us a certain transparency on the part of this teacher. He doesn't have all the answers, and he knows he doesn't have all the answers. He's going to search out and apply what he knows because there is more to apply even with all this wisdom. I think it's important for us to hear, not just, you know, he's not taking just someone else's word for it, he is applying himself to this investigation. He's doing what we find in, in Proverbs chapter 2, where it says, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And so he's searching out. There's a certain humility that comes with this process and that's something we can appreciate it actually endears us to him as readers so imagine you have two candidates who are vying for a prominent position maybe you can think of something offhand and these candidates are are being asked difficult questions and one one is asked a difficult question before the question is even finished he blurts out i know the answer that i know how to fix it we got to do this, we got to do this. And this other person has, has no idea what they're talking about. Oh, and they haven't even answered yet. Um, now, well, what, if, uh, well, what if one of the candidates answered like this? Well, you know, that's a really complex issue. 
And I, I think a healthy direction would move us this way, but I need to learn a lot more about that and grow in my understanding. I realize we've left American politics well behind at that point, <laughs> right? But just imagine that. Imagine if one of those candidates for a position responded that way. What, what, is that, what does that do for the audience? What does that do for you? When you hear that response. Um, you know, it, it endears us to that candidate because we think, well, this is a real person. Maybe there's some level of honesty and transparency here. I might want to listen some more to what they have to say. Um, so th- that's what it is with our preacher king. He's making the search. He's going there with us. And he applies his wisdom to everything he sees and experiences. All the objects of our busyness under the sun. And it's, it's gone in a moment. Nathaniel and I were, were driving the state park the other weekend and we were going to, to pull off for some supper and we saw the sign, the restaurant we were going to, and so I, I pulled into the left-hand turn lane and the, the road before that sign off of Highway 64 going into Conway and we thought we would work our way behind the storefronts to this restaurant, but once we pulled in and pulled into the parking lot, that was it. There was no other place to go. So we had to backtrack, turn around, and, and go a little bit farther down the road. Um, a dead end. Couldn't get there. The business that we are about every day, the preacher says it's ultimately a dead end. All the objects of my investigation, not not, not going to take us really, really want to go. And he used one of his favorite pictures here. We're going to read this many times in this book. Striving after wind. You can't catch it. You'll be endlessly frustrated. Your human experience, my human experience, will not ultimately change things. And then he concludes this narrative with, with the poetry of verse 15. What is crooked cannot be made straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. Meaning... There's a zero quantity here. You can't count something or someone that that there's nothing there to begin with. And these crooked things, all of the irregularities of life, all the obstacles that we will face in our human endeavors, that you're playing with that slinky and it gets stretched out in that one spot. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I hope you've played with slinky at some point in your life. But you can push it together and you can twist it to try to make it back. You're done. You're going to need a new slinky because it will always be crooked, bent. So the the troubles, the frustrations that we face, they come back around. They come back around. A couple things we need to hear take from not very encouraging verses. Um, In Genesis 3, we see the great deceiver the, the, the tempter slithering his way into the garden. He, he dangles a key. He dangles a key in front of Eve, in front of our first parents. At least something that looks like a key. Uh, key to this life. I want to read you the language of Eve's response, of humanity's response. Genesis 3. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So they could have divine wisdom. Be just like God. They could hold the key to life. You see, the very first wisdom lesson for human beings was not to try and either displace God or try to be on on an equal playing field as the Creator God, the first wisdom lesson was to obey. To acknowledge that they are not God and must live under God's authority and God's gracious rule. This was no key. It was a devious trick. A trick. Disobeying God could never lead to the wisdom of God that they most desired. The path of wisdom never lies with disobedience to God. So as we're we're learning already on this journey, we can be wise in all the ways of this world. 
and it will still be unsatisfied. We'll hit the dead end. We are not omniscient. We do not have the wisdom of the Creator God. We do not hold the key. Another thing we need to hear, and this really, it's not a profound revelation, but a, a merciful reminder of the Lord through this preacher, is that there are times, and there are many times, when we cannot fix it. Slinky. We, we can't fix it. We want to fix it. We want to straighten things out. We want to straighten what's crooked. You know, the, the relationship that seems irreparable, we want to fix it. We want to fix a controversy that seems to be you know, insurmountable. This tragedy that's impacted those we know and love, we want to fix that. Maybe if we knew more, maybe if we had prepared a little bit more, maybe if we had some more wisdom, we could could straighten the crooked. We could fix what needs to be most fixed in our lives. But the wisdom of this world isn't the key. There are going to be things in your life, there's going to be things in my life, just look at these last few months, half a year or so, the things that we've experienced that, that cannot be fixed. So we lift our eyes, we turn our attention, we turn the attention, the eyes of our brothers and sisters to the locksmith, the one who holds the key. The only one who can can open the door of purpose, satisfaction that we long for. So, So hold that out, hold that, communicate that to your brothers and sisters in those moments where it can't be fixed. Go to the Creator. You know, after Genesis 3, God doesn't stop humanity from having to deal with the vanity. Uh, this vanity, this life that passes in a breath, it goes on because God lets it do that. Which I mean, it's a somewhat strange way to exalt the character of God, but it's doing that because God is allowing us to see the vanity. He's allowing us to see the frustration, to sort of sit in it. The paradise of Eden, that is, that is gone. God could have stopped that from happening, but He didn't. He could have erased all this vanity. So I think a creature wants us to sit in that. So the object of this investigation, everything about our lives, it's running after wind but so is the mode of investigation itself. The mode of wisdom, to have more and more wisdom, and then compare that to the opposite, the foolishness. Again, he's going to expand on on how he applied this wisdom in chapter 2, but for now he just summarizes all this wisdom, all wisely searching for the key, even that is not a game changer. I was thinking about owls this week. I'd, I'd seen an I saw an owl you know, fly from one tree to the next. I was in the car the other day, and I saw pictures of owls this last week as I was at Abundant Life for a little while. But owls are often associated as a symbol for wisdom uh, in, in folklore and in, in tales. But it's a sad reality that the owl can still get hit by the, the car and end up as you know, a pile of feathers alongside the road. Maybe not the most pleasant image. <laughs> but all this wisdom, you know, to be the wisest owl still ends up a pile of feathers. Wind chasing for the teacher. Which could then lead us to the question, well, is this teacher then, is he saying it's not a good idea? Is he despising wisdom? Is he saying that this mode of investigation really should be abandoned? Because this is what we hear in Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Is that what he's doing? Is he playing the fool? No, he's, he's not trading wisdom for foolishness. Okay, wisdom is preferable to folly, but worldly wisdom is not the key to the safe. It's not going to deliver what we would most like. So we need, we need to remember that, that the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of this world, The Lord, Lord speaks to His people. I want to read a few verses here from the prophet Isaiah. It says, Because His people draw near with their mouth 
and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me. And their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish. The discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. The Apostle Paul would concur, 1 Corinthians 1, that God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. So let, let's be those who are you know, listening to the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of this world. Okay. Not, not even the wisdom or understanding of ourselves, Proverbs 3, 5. And that, that's really hard for us because we think we know. But who are we listening to? Who are you listening to? You know, if, our, if our main feeds are the social media and the blogosphere and the political pundits or the latest celebrity rant, we, we can gain or lose some worldly wisdom, but we will not find the answers to the great questions of our hearts. We need to listen to God, to tune into His Word. He ordains whatsoever comes to pass. And so we can have a greater confidence, a greater assurance that we're actually listening, that we're actually tuned in to the wisdom of God as we walk in obedience to His Word. So he concludes here with a little poetry. In much wisdom is much vexation. He who increases knowledge increases sorrow. The more knowledge you acquire, the more wisdom you apply, the more you see things the way they really are in this world. And that can hurt. It can grieve our souls. Parents, grandparents, mentors, you know this full well. You watch your children, grandchildren. You know the decision they're making is going to hurt. You know you've been there. You've experienced that. You know they're going to, it's going to be a hard, hard thing to learn. It grieves you. There's sorrow there because of your wisdom. So even this mode of investigation, the mode of wisdom brings grief and more to lament over. But I wonder, even as, as we read this, could this place of vexation, this place of sorrow, actually be part of the goal while we labor under the sun? A goal of lament. Think of Jesus in Luke chapter 13, where we hear the cry of Christ as he, he looks upon the city, those he came to deliver. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the, the city that kills the prophets. Stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood. But you are not willing. And so the greater Solomon, the infinite wisdom of Jesus, leads him to lament over those that he came to save. So that the wisdom of God may very well lead us here to that place of lament where we cry out to God, we implore His help, we trust in, in His character as revealed to us by His Word. And we lean into his, his mercy and kindness and compassion, what we know He can do and will do again. And then we do that again and again and again. And so the sorrow of wisdom deepens our faith, dependence upon the Lord. November newsletter coming out. You can read a little bit more thoughts on Lament. So we don't look to worldly wisdom as the key to our longings. Our longings for those leftovers. Something to gain from our toil. We look to the locksmith, the wisdom of God that's found in His Word. And this Word tells us that the wisdom of God, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is found in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in, in John 16, that in this world you will have trouble. You will have tribulation. You will have frustration. We can't escape this affliction, this toil under the sun, which means that the answers we long for, any resolution from this unhappy business, has to come from somewhere else than under the sun. And the course of human history, in all our days of vanity, this has happened once. Vanity is answered with what? Remember? Vanity is answered how? 
with eternity. And so the God who was, the God who is, the God who always will be, the God of eternity entered into this world that he had made. And the world didn't know him. They did not receive him. Even when he breathed in the air of this atmosphere under the sun, and he felt the, the heat of the sun. He endured the frustration of working with his hands. He knew the stares. He knew the rejection of those who did not understand. The God of eternity in the face of Jesus says to you, in this world you have trouble. I've experienced it. I've seen it. I know the affliction that fills your days. But then Jesus says something. He says something that not even the wise teacher could ever say. He says, take heart. Take heart. I have overcome the world. Let's pray together. Lord God, you have promised you who came to our rescue have experienced what we experience, but without sin. In the midst of this frustration and vanity, Lord, you hold the key. And so we look to you in dependence and trust on this day. Lord, show us how so much that we cannot fix leads us to you in dependence. Show us how to lament as your people. We are grateful for this word, though it can be hard to hear and digest. We look to you, Lord, who says, who calls us to take heart. For you have overcome this world. You hold the key. And we trust you to show us, to show us your glory, to show us the meaning, the satisfaction, the purpose that we long for, for it can be found only in you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.